Welcome to AP Biology. Today I want to look at a bunch of experiments and help you figure out what the controls are and to justify why that uh, particular control was used. And so what we're looking at in this example, um, let's read it. The unicellular organism Leishmania undergoes apoptosis-like cell death similar to cancer cells. So the reason that scientists are studying this unicellular organism is that it's similar to cancer cells. And um, this just means cell death. We'll talk about that in a few months when we get to the um, unit on that. Researchers investigated the effectiveness of three different botulin derivatives. Uh, here are their names, should be a comma, as drugs um, to kill this single-celled organism. These derivatives act as topoisomerase inhibitors. An inhibitor stops or slows down something. In this case, it's slowing down an enzyme used in DNA replication. We'll get to that too. Okay, so what we have here is the independent variable, the concentration in micromolar uh, concentration of these different drugs. And so there uh, is no drug here, and you can see there's 100% um, viability. So the dependent variable is viability of Leishmania. Viable means they're alive. If they're viable, they're alive. If they're inviable, they're dead. So um, here is looks like about one micromolar, maybe two and a half micromolar, something like that. Uh, five micromolar, 10 micromolar, etc. So this would be a test tube that's got some cells in it and they don't put any of the drugs in it and they see that all the cells are viable. And then right here you'd have three test tubes. This one would have DISB and this one would have DIG. DH, whatever, and this one would have this one in it. They would all have cells in it, and then you would wait uh, a certain amount of time, same amount of time for all of them, and um, you would measure the viability, and it looks like the viability sort of decreases um, depending on, on which line it is, okay? So, and then they repeat that for the rest of the uh, concentrations. So they have, um, maybe I didn't make that clear, they have more test tubes, three more test tubes for these, and three more here, and three more here. Okay, so it says identify the independent variable. That would be the concentration of these um, botulin derivatives. And then it says identify the difference between the control cells and the experimental cells. The control cells are the cells that were put in a test tube with zero micromolar anything, right? So it would be the cells with none of the drug at all and they had 100% viability. The experimental cells would be everything else. There would be all the different test tubes with all the different cells that had any amount or any concentration of any of these drugs. Okay, next example is very similar. So this one, again, shows cell viability as a dependent variable right here on the side. And then concentration, um, it doesn't really say of what, so let's read. MTT cell viability assay, the breast cancer cells were untreated or treated with MN3. This is just a graph I pulled off the internet. So the concentration of MN3 is what's um, the independent variable. Um, at various concentrations for 24, 48, and 72 hours, and cell viability was determined using some assay. Okay, so. What, they're, what you're looking at here is you have none of this MN3 and you can see 100% viability. And then they put in a little bit, 0.19 micrograms per mil of this MN3. And they must have had three different test tubes. One that they put the, they exposed the cells to this drug for 24 hours, that's this one. Another that they exposed the cells to this much of the drug for 48 hours. And another right here that they exposed um, the, drug, the cells to this much of the drug, 0.19 micrograms per mil, for 72 hours. So when it says over here, identify an independent variable, you could say either the different concentrations of MN3, or you could say the different time periods that the cells were exposed to the MN3. Either of those would be acceptable. And then it says, based on the data, identify a control that shows that MN3, rather than something else in the culture medium, is inhibiting the growth of cells. So you want to say the control is when you have zero micrograms per mil of this drug and you get 100% viability. The experimental cells would be all of these, and their viability is um, reduced in every case. All right, next example. I think this next one is actually really tricky. Um, a controlled experiment was conducted to analyze the effects of darkness and boiling on the photosynthetic rate of incubated chloroplast suspensions. So chloroplasts are the organelles in, in plant cells or in um, algae. 
that uh, do photosynthesis. So you would think with darkness, they wouldn't be doing too much photosynthesis, or if the chloroplasts are boiled, maybe they're not doing too much photosynthesis. But this study was done to look at the effects of darkness and to look at the, the effects of boils being boiled um, on whether they do photosynthesis. Each chloroplast suspension was mixed with whatever the heck this is, DPIP. It changes from blue to clear when it's reduced. I, I haven't taught you what reduced means yet, but it's changing color, so that means it's um, an indicator. Each sample was placed individually in a spectrophotometer. That's um, a piece of equipment that hopefully we'll be using this year, and uh, it measures um, how much how much color there is in something. So think photo meaning color and spectra like the spectrum of color and percent transmission or transmittance was recorded. So before I showed you these, ooh, that's a bad picture. We looked at these cuvettes. They're these cute little rectangular like tubes kind of and they're open on the top. And so let's say this is totally clear. You'd have um, zero absorbance, but it would be 100% transmittance, meaning all the light goes through. But if we instead had another cuvette and it changed from clear to blue, that means the whole thing would be dark in here, right? And that means most of it would be absorbed or none of it would be transmitted. So percent transmitted here would be in an extreme case, 0% and over here would be 100%. So transmittance and absorbance are opposites. So there were three samples used and they were the examples are as follows. So it says um, sample one, chloroplast suspension plus DPIP. That's this sample. And then sample two is chloroplast suspension surrounded by foil wrap to provide a dark environment. So here's sample two in a dark environment. And then finally sample three, which is this one, and chloroplast suspension that's been boiled. And it tells you right here, it's been boiled. So it says, identify and explain the control or controls for this experiment. So if you noticed in the last slide, it said the scientists were looking at the effects of darkness and the effects of light. Uh, sorry, they said the effects of darkness and the effects of boiling. I'll just run back. To analyze the effects of darkness and the effects of boiling on photosynthesis. So they are trying to study darkness. That's their experiment, right? Their experimental group. They're trying to study the effect of boils being boiled. That's their experimental group. Their control group, which it's kind of hard to get your head around this. Their controlled group is this one, light unboiled. So I always say with a control, you're taking something out, you're removing something. So if you look at, it's really like two experiments. One experiment is to look at the darkness. So if you look at the difference between these two, what have you taken out? Well, you've taken out the darkness out of this one. That's the only way I can understand this one. Um, and then if you're looking at the control compared to this one, the boiled, you're taking out the boiledness or you're taking out the deadness of the chloroplast. So um, that's, that's what they're looking for. So here's their answer, which I struggled with a little bit because whenever I think of controls, I think you're taking something out. And to me, taking darkness out of something is just kind of a backwards way to think about it, but that is what they want. They want simple one is the control. Their explanation is, um, so remember they asked for identify and explain, right? So one point to say sample one is the control. One point to say sample one is in the light and has like, it says permissive temperature or functional structures. You probably don't know that word, but what it means is it's in the light. So meaning it's not dark and it hasn't been boiled, meaning the chloroplasts are actually functional. So they're working. So they wanted you to say that there was a point to say something like that. This is a point that you could get whether you had any idea about what their right answer was anyway. So control is the basis for comparison to treatment effects. You can say that no matter what. So I don't care what experiment they give you. If you don't understand the experiment or even if you do understand the experiment and they ask you to explain the control, you should always say that a control is a basis for experiment uh, is the basis, a control is the basis for comparison to your experimental group or to your treatment group. And this point, you could get it, says you can award this point even if the wrong sample was identified. This bottom part was for a different question. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, control group example eight. Researchers conducted a study to investigate the effect of exercise on the release of prolactin, it's a hormone, into the blood. The researchers measured the concentration of prolactin in the blood of eight adult males at t equals zero hours and one hour after um, vigorous exercise. 
So that's shown right here. So this is um, zero hours, it says so right here. And then one hour after exercise, That's so that's like T zero and T one hour, right? Um, it looks like the one hour has um, higher prolactin, blood plasma prolactin levels. Um, I'll teach you what these error bars mean. What they actually mean in this case is that there, there's really no major difference between these two but that's not what we're asking right now anyway. It says as a control, so they're telling you what the control is, they're not asking you to figure it out. So as a control, the researchers measured the concentration of blood prolactin in the same group of individuals at the same times of day one week later, but without having them exercise. So T0 and T1, but no exercise. And um, then it says justify the use um, of the without exercise treatment as a control in the study design. So let's say there had been a change here. Maybe the change was due to just waiting an hour. Maybe as the day goes on, you make pro more prolactin. We don't really know, right? Is, the, is any difference due to the exercise or not? And so the reason that you would, the justification that you could give is that you need this control in order to actually compare it to the treatment group. So if, mm, so, if it's exercise, then you would see a difference here, but you wouldn't see a difference here. All right, next question is um, uh, kind of a tough one. So um, there are these mice called MSN mice, MSM mice, they are genetically modified. So this MSM mouse is a mouse strain that synthesizes different amounts of melatonin. Melatonin you might've heard of because you can, it's a natural hormone, but you can take it at night to help you sleep if you have trouble sleeping. And it says that these mice produce different amounts of melatonin in response to different photo periods. Um, and then there's, so this is the genetically modified mice, the MSM1. And I, you don't know that on here, but I happened to read the study that I stole this, uh, this chart from, this graph from. C57 is a mouse strain that's commonly used as a model in the laboratory. So these are model mice, meaning like just regular, not genetically modified mice. Scientists studied the effect of photoperiodic variation on body size. Wow, who knew that would be something, right? So photoperiodic variation, a photoperiod is how much light there is. So you can expose mice to three hours of light or 17 hours of light. That would be a different photo periods, different um, photo for light, right? Different amounts of, of light. And so they think melatonin maybe has something to do with body size. Maybe the more melatonin you have, the bigger you are, I don't know. So they wanted to study that. So MSM, mice and C57 mice were kept in long period or short period um, photo periods for six weeks. So here's the key. So this is um, lots of light, long photo period and short photo period, long photo period and short photo period. I don't know why that came out kind of gray, but it's, it's this one. Okay, so um, first of all, what this is showing is that there's really no difference between long photo period and short photo period for the genetically modified mice. Maybe they don't make as much melatonin uh, at all, right? And maybe that affects body size somehow. Um, for the model mice, there's really no difference between long photo period and short period photo period here either. But there certainly is a difference between these C57 mice and these MSM mice. So that's um, kind of interesting. Okay, then there's another part of the question. So now this is part two. So this um, graph was the same one you saw on the last slide. And then it says comp the compound N propionyl 5 methoxytryptamine ooh that's a long one pmt so some compound some chemical called pmt is a pineal gland inhibitor inhibitor again means to stop pineal gland is in your head and it actually makes melatonin you kind of even you don't even need to know that but whatever so it blocks the production of melatonin so pmt blocks melatonin right um, and we said something about the MSM mice were, um, remember they had been genetically modified and maybe they don't make as much melatonin. So in a second experiment, the scientists treated the MSM mice and the C57 mice with 500 micrograms per mil solution of this thing that stops them from making melatonin. And it was recorded, uh, they recorded the body mass size. And that's what it's showing you in figure two, which I think they already have over here. Good. Okay, so here's figure two. It says identify the dependent variable in the experiments. Dependent variable is the body mass on the y-axis. Um, 
And then it says, identify a control group missing from the second experiment. So what they're saying is this is experiment one, and this is experiment two. And so in experiment two, they used that um, PM, was it PMT? PMT. They used PMT. And so they put the, they gave the PMT to both the long and the short photoperiod mice that were genetically modified. And they also gave it to both the long and the short photoperiod mice, uh, uh, mice that were the normal ones that were put in the long and the short photoperiod. Um, now it looks like there's no difference between any of them. But you might notice that this is actually quite a bit different from this. So these had no PMT and these did have PMT. So here's the thing. Um, it says, I, let's see, identify a control group missing from the second experiment. So you might say, well, why don't we just say that this, this second experiment could just use this as a control group, right? Um, you can't really do this. AP wants you to know that when you run an experiment, each experiment needs its own control. You can't just run an experiment and say, well, yeah, three months ago we tested this and we found that, you know, we found these results over here. Um, you, you can't, whoops. You can't just use a previous experiment's results as your control. You have to do a control at the same time as your experimental stuff because there could be other things that are messed up in your lab, right? Maybe there was some contamination in your lab and maybe the results that you're getting actually have nothing to do with PMT. Maybe it's that like mold got in and it's disturbing the mice and they're not growing very big, right? So you really need to do either this or this, or I would say do both of them in with this experiment, you need to do it at the same time. And then they say justify the need for this control. So what they're saying is um, acceptable control groups would be the C57 mice from the first experiment without PMT or the MSM mice from the first experiment without PMT. I would suggest both of them are important. The, the justification is that the missing control is needed because the effective PMT on body mass can't be determined without comparison um, to the body mass under the same conditions without PMT. So in other words, you need this data as a control in order to really understand what's going on over here. So you can't say that the C57 mice were smaller with the PMT than if they didn't have the PMT. You can't say the smaller body mass was due to this PMT, the, the thing that stopped the mel melatonin, right? Um, unless you have something to compare it to, which would be this. All right. Um, and that is um, the end of our negative control group experiment examples. Um, I hope it was helpful.